I think it's a huge loss. Today, a final farewell to Prince Philip. I, Philip, will become your lead man of life and death. The longest serving royal consort in British history, he was the Queen's husband, her rock, for 73 years. Patriarch to a family now gathered to say goodbye. The ceremony subdued by the pandemic, now quiet as the Prince had wanted. My dear Papa was, uh, was a very special person. He might have been our father, grandfather, father-in-law, but, but he, he meant so much to so many other people. A life defined by service, by support for his queen and love for his country and commonwealth. Today, honored. This is the funeral for Prince Philip. And this is a live look at Windsor Castle right now, a mercifully warm, sunny spring day in the United Kingdom. This is where Prince Philip's funeral is being held. It is the royal family's hearth. Normally, Windsor is a place to gather. It was the place where the Queen and Prince Philip quarantined for months and where the Duke of Edinburgh ultimately died. And so today's funeral is a much smaller, more contained ceremony than originally planned, as, as everyone can understand, given the moment we're in now. The public have been pointedly asked to watch or listen but not gather. Good morning, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Welcome to the National Studio and to our special coverage of the funeral for Prince Philip. The Duke of Edinburgh died a week ago Friday at the age of 99. His funeral has been planned for years. His wishes fundamental to much of what you're about to see. The pandemic, of course, has intervened. So what will happen today will be a scaled back version of the original plan, very focused on his family and his military ties. It will begin with a family procession from Windsor Castle to St. George's Chapel, just a few minutes away. Normally, this would be through the streets of London. And all of this is due to begin in about half an hour's time. So let's head over now to Rene Filipponi, who is in Windsor. So Rene, I, I know we're seeing, you know, some of the military bands and we're seeing some of, some of the uh, branches of the military to which he was very attached. But can you help us understand what we're going to see over the next hour leading up to the ceremony? Well, as you mentioned, we've been seeing this military parade now for the last little while. 730 members of the armed forces are taking part in the procession and the proceedings today here at Windsor Castle. Everything is going to happen behind castle doors. The public is not invited again because of COVID restrictions. But the Duke himself really has his finger on his own funeral. He planned a lot of it. So have, here's a look of how things are going to unfold over the next hour or so. Uh, the military members in procession right now are going to arrive at the Quandragle at Windsor Castle. At one point, we will have the Land Rover, the Duke of Edinburgh uh, designed himself, and in fact started designing it 18 years ago, will arrive and it will carry his co coffin from Windsor Castle to St. George's Chapel. Behind that coffin, we will see members of the royal family, Princess Ch Prince Charles, Princess Andrew, Princess uh, Princess Anne, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward. Behind them, that line everyone's been talking about, Prince William and Prince Harry, who will be um, separated by Peter Phillips, the son of Princess Anne. Behind them will be the Queen in the state Bentley. She will follow them behind with the, her lady of waiting in the car with her. She will be masked, we're told. And the procession from the castle to the chapel will take a total of eight minutes. There will be a lot of ceremony involved in that. Um, the Queen will get out first and join the other members of the royal family who are already going to be headed to and arriving before her at the chapel. Um, once the coffin arrives, it will head up the stairs and that's when there will be a moment of silence. The nation will pause. In fact, we're being told we're right near Heathrow Airport here. Even flights will not be arriving or landing for the six minutes around that period of time. So, Renee, I have to say, as we look at some of these pictures and I listen to your descriptions, in Canada, people watching this, depending upon where they are, are, are potentially heading into very strict lockdowns for COVID, facing soaring numbers, being restricted on how many people they can be with outside, even uh, waiting for vaccinations. And so it's a bit unnerving to look at, at, at some of the pictures of people close together and unmasked. And I'm just curious, how front of mind is the pandemic there in the United Kingdom in this moment? What is the status there? 
well, just like everyone around the world, people here are, are worried and watching these variants. However, things appear to be under control. There has been a lockdown, a hard lockdown in place since early January. The vaccine program has been quite successful. So we are at a stage here where things are actually rolling out. This is the first weekend since that lockdown where people are allowed to uh, leave their home communities and, and travel for non-essential reasons. So if you actually look at the city of Windsor, which uh, you know has been quite quiet during this lockdown, there are lots of people there today, not just reporters, not just security and police, but people who may be visiting the town just to get out of the city or maybe there as well today um, to, with the hopes of getting a glimpse at one of the royals. Okay, Renee, thank you very much. As you speak, we've been looking at pictures from within the quadrangle of Windsor Castle where, where much of the ceremony will begin in terms of, of assembling the family and then as the coffin uh, begins to proceed. But we're still in, in the part of this day where... Uh, it is largely ceremonial leading up to the moment of the procession. Renee, we will be back in touch with you uh, throughout this morning. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And so as we mentioned, the funeral will begin with a procession. The Duke's coffin carried on that Land Rover. You heard Renee describe that he helped design uh, something he started working on back in 2003. He got so specific as to ask for the paint color to be changed at the last minute uh, a few years ago, just to something that was more appropriate for the military service. Behind that coffin, members of the royal family will be walking. This is the route we expect them to take. This is the route it will take, all on the castle grounds. The coffin will depart at the state entrance of Windsor Castle, flanked by military pallbearers. It will pass by the Round Tower and head to the west steps of St. George's Chapel. Route, it is not at all what was in the original plan, which was known as Operation Fourth Bridge, which was to involve much of London, but this is the moment we are all in now. So Windsor Castle, I, I think, is, as is understood, is in the community of Windsor. And as you can probably imagine, it is a place where almost Everywhere you turn, people have stories and very close ties to the royals. Margaret Evans is with us with how people there are marking this day. Adrian, we're just outside Windsor Castle. On the other side of the wall behind me is St. George's Chapel, which is, of course, where the funeral service is going to be taking place. As you know, Buckingham Palace, the British government, have really been encouraging people to watch the funeral from home. They don't want large numbers coming down to Windsor because of the COVID restrictions. And I think for the most part, people are trying to respect that. The mood here is very mellow. There are a lot of journalists, a lot of people out enjoying the sunshine. But but not huge crowds. There are a few people who've come down with their flowers, and if they do, they're taken by stewards back to the other side of the castle walls so that the royal family can actually see them. The people of Windsor, of course, have a very special relationship to the royal family. They feel that they're, they're neighbors. So if you talk to people, they'll have tales of sightings. They'll talk about seeing Prince Philip riding his carriage with his ponies around town well into his 90s. And of course, during this past year, we've seen Prince Philip and the Queen spending most of the pandemic here at Windsor, and people say that that has made them feel even closer to the royal fam family. There's genuine affection uh, from people here as they watch the family try to say goodbye to the Duke of Edinburgh, particular concern, of course, to the Queen, who is saying farewell to her husband of 73 years, Adrian. Remarkable, you consider that the Queen's birthday is on Wednesday. She will be 95 years old. It will be her first birthday uh, without her prince in 73, 74 years. So as, you're, as we are waiting here, what you're, what you're seeing is, is that the military units and the marching bands have been uh, forming up their contingents in Home Park, which is not that far away, so that they can then proceed to the quadrangle of, of Windsor Castle to eventually move on to St. George's Chapel. So I think that one of the groups you have just seen is the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. All of these units have, were chosen particularly by the Prince because of his affiliations with them. As you can imagine, when word spread that the Prince had died, there was an immediate outpouring of, of stories and of memories about him. They came from 
all over the world and from all kinds of people because he was known as this very affable man. And former BBC royal correspondent Wesley Kerr has many of both those stories and memories. Thank you, Wesley, for joining us today. You know, we understand well that, that Windsor Castle holds a special place for the Queen. It certainly did for Prince Philip. The significance is also rich to you. No, Windsor Castle is such an amazing and remarkable place, the largest inhabited castle in the world. The Queen is the 41st monarch for whom this has been a castle. Um, it was actually started by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. I've been associated with Windsor Castle all my life. As a boy, I lived quite near. We used to come here for picnics. When the Queen gave me my OBE, it was here. I was here the day of the fire. I was here for the restoration. But this means so much in Philip's life. This, amazingly, this is where his grandmother was born in 1863 in the presence of Queen Victoria. His mother was born here in 1885 in the presence of Queen Victoria. His mother's funeral was here in 1969. So, he, so though he was a prince of Greece and Denmark, he was, of course, like Her Majesty, the great-great-grandchild of Queen Victoria. And then it's been very powerful in their lives. They're the first royal couple really to live here as almost their main home since Victoria and Albert. So it was so appropriate that he should die here overlooking the Eastern Terrace Gardens, which he had laid out. He's ranger or was ranger of Windsor Great Park for, for nearly 70 years, as he was also in charge of Sandringham and Balmoral. And he was incredibly innovative in his estate management, in his tree planting. I'm told that the staff working on the Crown Estate here, they feel they worked for him. Many have been here 50 years. They would see him carriage driving. If there was something he didn't like in the estate, he, they would get a handwritten note the next day. He, he would go round this estate actually without escort. The Queen loves it here. Yesterday, she, she drove down to a part of the estate, Frogmore Gardens, with, with the two dogs, the doggy and the corgi. That's her favorite relaxation. This place, incredibly special. And he was so innovative. I mean, he even created a vineyard here so that at state banquets, you can get English wine. That's incredible. And as I listen to all of this that you know, I'm curious about what it is that you feel because you, as a correspondent, traveled with them. Uh, you must have had encounters that, that are rattling around in your own head today. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I've been looking back and suddenly realized, actually, I knew this, this great gentleman for 40 years. He was Chancellor of Cambridge University when I was there in the late 1970s. I remember him making an incredible speech to a couple of hundred students no notes, speaking for about an hour. And it was just before Margaret Thatcher came to power. And he said, and he was asked, what will it be like if there's a woman running the country? He said, I rather think a woman has been running the country for the last quarter of a century. The day I graduated in 1979, I was at a drinks reception and I was talking to him, Mother Teresa, and the Tory politician, conservative politician, Rab Butler, former deputy prime minister of this country. Butler said to Edinburgh, this young man, Wesley Kerr, wants to be Prime Minister of Jamaica. The Duke said, uh, why on earth would you want to do something like that? And in fact, I think it was probably quite good career advice. I became a journalist instead and actually later did a, a marvellous tour of the Caribbean with the Queen and the Duke, a three-week tour in 1994, Guyana, Belize, the Cayman Islands, Jamaica, the Bahamas, Bermuda. So it was uh, like one of these incredible tours and you saw the energy with which they went about their business. The program maybe started at 8 in the morning, went on till 11 in the evening. You saw how incredibly fond they were of each other, how dependent they were on each other. Amazingly little security in, that days, in those days. She had one policeman, he had a policeman, and there was a spare. They relied entirely on the security forces of the various Commonwealth countries and realms. They were her realms and she relied on the security available to, to and ju just incredible. All the politicians said she, she's known all the prime ministers of this country. I remember Michael Manley saying to me in Jamaica, uh, they're impressed at her knowledge, her desire to do walkabouts and communicate, but it was a marvelous sort of companionship. There was one moment in Bermuda where I was actually alone with them. I was sending my dispatch back to London from the governor's desk in Bermuda and I became aware that there was a presence in, in, through the open door and suddenly these two heads came round it with waving as though they were like taking applause for the report I'd send. It was the Queen and the Duke waving and then they went upstairs. She became very interested in my family. I remember her saying, 
um, when we were in Jamaica, um, saying to me, did, did, did you see your father, Mr. Kerr? And then, and I told her, yes, I had. And then she said, and did he see me? So I love the idea that she wanted to feel and Philip wanted to feel that the incredible work they were doing was rewarded. And I think in Canada, you would have had the same feeling on the many visits they made there. And I think they made 23 visits together, starting in 1951, when they were the Edinburghs. And um, I think over 60 visits the Duke made. It, it's just astonishing. Um, so I think that Canada was, was extremely close to their hearts, as it, as it had been to, to the Queen's parents, you know, the famous, the famous tour mm -hmm. before, 19, before the Second World War. So, so, so I, think that, I think that the Commonwealth, I think if there's one memorial to the work, I, I mean, yes, so places like this, it's the trees and the forests and the environment and the work with the World Wildlife Fund, the Duke of Edinburgh's award. But I think, I think one thing which was their real passion project internationally was this free association of nations which turned possibly the bad of empire into something incredibly positive. And, I, um, and, uh, and in fact, there's an environmental aspect of that because the Queen has this project, the Queen's Commonwealth Canopy, which, which, which is to, you know, to, 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 to restore forests, to plant trees, all over Canada, as in so many other Commonwealth countries, there are trees planted by the Queen and the Duke, whether it's Rideau Hall or, 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 or you know, on any, anywhere, really, Ontario, Vancouver, wherever there's a governor's mansion, or so, that you will find that there are trees on these many visits planted by the royals. So that's a rather good memorial to them. Absolutely. But there's so much that this man did, it's, it's hard to know where, where to stop. In, indeed, and Wesley Kerr, I have to say, your stories and your experiences are extraordinary. Thank you so much for sharing them with us today. Well, I, I, I think he was a very remarkable man. I mean, he was born a prince, married a princess, but made himself into a great man. And, and I think we remember that great man today. Indeed. Thank you, Wesley. And so if we can take a breath here now just get a handle on, on what is happening. All of the military units have formed within the quadrangle at Windsor Castle. The next thing we expect to happen is that the family members who are not walking in the procession will get in their cars and head towards St. George's Chapel. We've seen a couple key images go by that I think are, are worth noting. You saw the Land Rover go by. That is the one that he rolled up his sleeves and, and helped design starting some 18 years ago, right down to the, the placement of the rubber stoppers in the back to hold the coffin, right down to the color of the paint. And, and quite touchingly, you saw the carriage. So if, I, I believe we have this picture. There it is. So that is uh, one of the Duke's carriages. Uh, he designed this as well. This is a man who adored the sport of carriage driving. As you heard some of the, uh, Margaret Evans in particular say, he was often seen driving the carriage right through Windsor. Those are his horses. On the front seat of that carriage are his cap and his gloves. And this is, this will mean a lot to the people who are gathered there because their image of him will have been so often in that carriage on those grounds on a beautiful spring day just like this one. So while we watch, and there it is, there's the cap and the gloves. While we watch, let's bring in some friends here. Let's bring in some familiar faces. Former CBC London Bureau Chief Anne McMillan and historian and broadcaster Dan Snow. Lucky for us, they sometimes come as a package. Dan is <laughs> Anne's son. We've always considered you, Dan, an honorary CBC here. You have both covered the royal family for years. You've met them. You've spent time with them. And I'm wondering how you are remembering Prince Philip today. Anne, may we start with you? Lovely to see you, by the way. Nice to see you too, Adrian. Um, I, I would say that I'm remembering him, and I hope he'd want to be remembered, as what he always said was his most important job, supporting the Queen. And I've been talking to a lot of people this week who had close contact with Prince Philip and his wife, the Queen. And one of them told me a really interesting story. She'd worked at Buckingham Palace and said, she said to me, all these stories about what a wonderful support he was are absolutely true. And she said, the Queen was very nervous about doing those Christmas messages. And she used to really get terribly worked up about it. And Prince Philip would sit with her for two weeks before she had to record the message, go through the 
the message, and each, make her read it over and over again until she was very confident. And if there were words that didn't roll off her tongue, he'd change them for her. And that was just one example of just how diligent he was in supporting his mother. And, and Dan, I, I'm curious, you know, as, as we watch all of the involvement of all the different military units, can you help place for us Prince Philip's relationship with the military? Yeah, I, I can. I can try. The, 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 as you can see, there's you know there's 700 military personnel involved <laughs> from all the different arms of the of the British armed forces. And, and being British, we've got all sorts of uniforms and traditions that are unique. We saw that the two senior cavalry regiments in the uh, uh, of the, of the Life Guards there, the Blues and Royals, uh, of, the, of the Household Cavalry, the Blues and Royals and Life Guards. Um, we've got uh, the riflemen. We've got people more in the world. But I mean, he was. A, a naval man, in terms of his say, he flew the RAF taught him how to fly. He flew for years um, in RAF aircraft uh, until very late in his life, indeed. But he was uh, during the Second World War. He was a naval guy, uh, and he uh, worked alongside the Canadian Navy, which my mum's dad, my grandpa, was uh, proudly in um, HMCS Prince Robert. But so Philip would have served alongside many Canadian ships, uh, and he served in the Mediterranean. He served in the Far East. He was there when Japan surrendered in Tokyo Bay. He saved the ship once off Sicily in 1943 because he threw a kind of fiery raft over the side of his ship, and, and uh, it was bombed instead of his ship by, uh, by Axis aircraft. So he serves on the front line, very, very, yeah, very distinguished, long before he ever married the Queen. Uh, and so I think that's you know, a huge part of today is, is, is the military connection. And he got Canadian medal. He's, had, he's been decades, he's got the Canadian uh, Medal of Military Merit as well. And I, I and know- And it's gonna be on display in the in the on the altar, in um, in the chapel, Interesting. and uh, with, along with the two Canadian, they were the only country that gets two, uh, the only Commonwealth country that gets two uh, medals on display today, and uh, they were sewed onto pillows, I'm told, by seamstresses in St James's Palace with fishing tax, fishing wire. Anyway, the other one is the Order of Canada, which Prince Philip was also um, awarded. He, he would have, I suspect, he would have loved the, the fishing line. Approach. I, just as uh, as people are watching here, uh, what we have seen is some of the vehicles arrive to carry the family members who are not in the procession uh, to St George's Chapel. I know you are also watching what is happening. What are you seeing here, Dan? So there's the Royal Horse Artillery. These are the um, these are the people that fire the, the the multiple gun salutes on special occasions, the Queen's birthday, and now a sad occasion, which is uh, Prince Philip's funeral. But they've been they've been doing this job for a very long time. They traditionally they would gallop into battle and they would unhook these kind of they were sort of mobile artillery. They'd unhook these guns uh, and find that the enemy they could be rapidly deployed. And then they kind of took on a ceremonial role. Uh, they were made a royal by the queen's dad. He just added his name to they, they were the royal they, they were the horse artillery and he, and he added royal in his own handwriting once when he came to visit them. Um, and we can see some of the some of the royal dukes. So it was the Duke of Gloucester we saw getting in a car and, and driving off as well. It's not a very long drive. This is not the, the procession through the streets of London that had been anticipated. But, but from listening to you, it sounds like this has as much or more meaning for the family in particular. I, we will check back in with, with both of you. Uh, I, I'm very eager to he hear what this day feels like for you and, and some of your stories. I know you've got more. Uh, so we will check back in soon, Anne and Dan. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, we know that uh, the Queen had a moment, or rather, Prime Minister Trudeau had a moment with the Queen uh, yesterday on the phone. They, they talked a little bit about their memories, his memories of, of meeting the family, and, and Renee Filponi, who is standing by and watching this with us. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Renee? Well, yeah, there was that meeting over the phone between the two of them, and now we are hearing just this hour that the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has also sent out a statement um, in memory of the Duke of Edinburgh. And it reads that Canadians were deeply saddened to hear last week of the passing of the Duke and that the thoughts continue to be with Her Majesty and members of the royal family as they mourn the loss of a beloved husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. It also reads that the Duke of Edinburgh was a lifelong companion to our Queen and a dear friend to Canada. Canada, who was also a devoted public servant whose contributions changed countless lives around the world. You know, if this weren't, it wasn't COVID times, the Prime Minister would have traveled here um, for this service, along with many other states of head, head of states, but that clearly isn't the case. There is one Canadian, however, 
who will be a part of the procession. Brigadier Paul Doyle, I actually saw him in one of the shots earlier. He is standing right now out in front of uh, St. George's Chapel. He will be there when the coffin and the royal family procession arrives. And he saw this as a, a great honor. Have a listen to what he told me earlier. Prince Philip uh, in the Second World War served alongside Canadians and the service that he had with the Royal Navy. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, after the Second World War, uh, the association that he had with the Canadian Armed Forces is extremely long-standing. Uh, so uh, I really see me being there uh, to bear witness to the service that Prince Philip uh, rendered, not just to the United Kingdom, but to Canada also, uh, in everything that he did uh, for us who serve in the military. And I'm extremely uh, honoured, I'm humbled, and uh, it's, it's a privilege to be able to be there for the Canadian Armed Forces. As we've been now, talking... I also spoke to him as well about... Oh, I was just going to say, I spoke to him as well about during the rehearsals, and he just wanted to make it clear how military precision everything is timed right down to the second this procession needs to reach the chapel just in time for that one minute of silence, which will happen right before the funeral service at 3 p.m. British time. So we're not that far away from that now, Renee, but as you've been speaking, we've been watching pictures of, of some of the family members, uh, not the ones who are walking in the procession, but some of the others who have been arriving by car. We've seen Princesses Eugenie and Beatrice. We will also likely see the Duchess of Cornwall, Duchess of Cambridge, uh, which is Kate Middleton and Camilla Parker Bowles arriving there as well. From where you are standing, what are you seeing now? Well, you know, we are here at Home Park watching the broadcast of this as well. Everything is going right to order. Once those members of the royal family who aren't in, in the procession have left, that's when um, that coffin, the, the Land Rover that will carry that coffin will arrive. Uh, and that's when the next step in these proceedings will take place. That's when we're going to start seeing members of the royal family who will be behind that coffin and, and following it in that eight minute journey to the chapel. That's Princess Anne, Prince Charles, um, Princess Andrew and Edward, as well as Harry and William and, and other members of the family as well. And right now, here is that Land Rover. As you mentioned, he started the design on this 18 years ago, and it, it's in like a military color because that is really what he wanted it to be. He has his hands all over this ceremony, uh, and it's just what he wanted. And as you're speaking there, we are seeing that gleaming Land Rover arriving without the coffin. Of course, it is arriving to pick up the coffin and at that point once the pallbearers who are made up of, of particularly chosen members of different military units have placed the coffin on that Land Rover it will begin that that slow procession that is when we will see some other members of the family this is exactly what and behind he, those members I was just going to say Renee this is exactly what he wanted in the sense that that he was entitled to a different sort of funeral, a, a much grander one. And there was no ifs, ands, or buts from him about what he wanted. That was not going to happen. And to have his coffin on a Land Rover, you know, he has been associated with that vehicle for fif some 50 years. He has driven them his entire driving life. He's a man known to love love his vehicles, love to fly, love to go fast, love the military, and every little detail about that speaks to him. There is, of course, another vehicle that was made exactly like it to have standing by because nobody wants something to go wrong with that one. The, the people alongside the Land Rover, as you will see throughout this day, there will be a combination of people there. Uh, these are his pallbearers from, from the military right now. What, what is it you were going to say, Renee? I was just going to mention that, you know, once uh, we've been talking about the royal family behind um, the Land Rover, the big moment I think everyone, you know, is waiting for, it's going to be the image uh, that will stand in our minds is, is when the royal Bentley pulls up uh, and pulls up behind her members of the family, the queen in that royal Bentley um, with her mask on, seated beside her, her lady-in-waiting. 
Um, and, and I think that is going to be a poignant moment because you know we haven't seen her since this happened. As you mentioned, this is her husband of 70 plus years. Uh, the service is going to really be talking about that unwavering support he provided for her. Um, and that, for me, is, is the moment I'm wait going to be waiting to see. As we just take a moment here, I would, I would simply point out that around the quadrangle, in addition to the military units, are members of the household. So members of, of Windsor Castle household, what they called HMS Bubble, the people who stayed with uh, Prince Philip and the Queen throughout quarantine, uh, did not leave their sides, were with them right until the end to his end are there today um, to watch the man they worked with so closely um, depart. This is a good moment to bring in someone who knows the family, who knows the story of the royal family very well. Andrew Pierce is a royal commentator with the Daily Mail. Andrew, uh, it is always lovely to speak with you, and I, I'm just curious, what's on your mind in this moment? Do you know, I was just thinking how profoundly sad this is, because we think about the great role Prince Philip has spent in our lives. 73 years uh, he was married to the Queen, but it, this is also about the most extraordinary love affair. They, are the, they were the greatest double act, I think, in public life we've ever seen. And how heartbreaking this is going to be for the Queen, alone, sitting alone in a pew in St George's Chapel, a chapel she loves very much, for the funeral, not of the Duke of Edinburgh, but her husband, the father of her four children, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, uh, as Prince Andrew said, the grandfather of the nation. and. Um, I know that she spent some time this morning just alone with him, his coffin in the chapel he's in, uh, and um, the thoughts that must be going through her mind. What an extraordinary 73 years they've had together. Uh, and, um, and of course, this funeral has been absolutely Prince Philip to a tea, even including, of course, the firm order. There is to be no sermon, no homily. He wants no preaching because he could never stand that sort of thing. Interesting. We, w there is now five minutes, Andrew, until uh, the coffin appears. And I I'm struck that uh, he is everywhere but nowhere in the sense of this, that, that his presence, his absence, you know, I think Margaret Evans referred to him as an invisible pillar, um, is, is felt pretty heavily today. And I, I, I think so many people have seen him as an old man, but surely for the Queen, she must have in her head those pictures of him as this young, tall, blonde, strapping young man. He was a dashing figure. He was a heartthrob. Uh, and um, she fell wildly, wildly in love with him. And there have been some wonderful photographs released of them throughout the course of the week where you just see how happy she is in his company and how happy and relaxed he is in hers. It's been a remarkable relationship. And I think we all worry about the impact it will have on the Queen. Uh, will we see as much of her? Perhaps not so much. No talk of um, uh, uh, abdication, that would never happen. 
Uh, but I think she, she will be a little lost without him because he is that invisible pillar. Uh, we so rarely see the Queen on her own. Uh, we've noticed we've got used to it in the last three years since he retired from public life, but we knew he was always there with one firm hand on the tiller. Lord Charters, who was one of her longest advisors, said to me he was so important because he was the one person who treated the Queen as a human being and not as a monarch. And she was the one person who could say to Prince Philip, shut up. <laughs> That's a lovely story. Andrew Pierce, thank you very much. We are just a few minutes away from uh, the coffin appearing and keep in mind as we head into St. George's Chapel that that is a place uh, that has so much meaning as well. The Queen's father, former king, is buried there. Her sister, uh, who died 50 years exactly after uh, her father died, the funeral was held there in uh, St. George's Chapel. The Queen lost her sister, and then six weeks later, in 2002, lost her mother. Uh, she was there, she's been there for weddings as well, for Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, for the princesses. Uh, Eugenie, I think, who just had her wedding there not long ago. So there, there's lots of family in the rafters uh, and in the bones of that building for her there. Wondering if Dan Snow, if you can help us here. I see we see members of the royal household there, some of the medical staff in, in particular, who were tending to Prince Philip. But what are we about to see here, Dan? Well, we've got just as we listen to the uh, beautiful sound of Edward Elgar, one of the greatest British composers. Uh, always seems always to be played on occasions like this. So it's so, so poignant uh, and. Um, we're about to see uh, the um, guests arrive. We're about to see the pallbearers do their duty with the coffin. Um, as one of your previous speakers said, it's really interesting. They're all drawn from different parts of the armed forces, which she had a special connection with. Um, one, of the, one of them is the th third generation guardsman whose grandfather performed a similar duty at King George VI funeral. So it's just, you know, you're, you, we talk about Windsor as being a a place of national significance, but also an intimate place where this family have lived for generations. And, and uh, this chapel is like their kind of house chapel, but also for the military as well, like many members of the forces, many people serving today will have had ancestors, the forebears doing similar things on similar days. It's it's amazing. The thread of history is very visible. Uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm the first of four generations look serving the rifles that we just heard about earlier in the program, one uh, a unit that uh, Prince Philip's got a particular connection with. My dad, my grandpa, and my great-grandpa all served in that unit. Uh, and there's going to be many people here today who this will not be the first time their families have taken part in the event like this. Indeed. And then, Macmillan, I, I, I'm wondering what strikes you about this. I know that you've been, you know, as, as a journalist, thinking about this day and this moment and, and in some ways knew what it would look like, but what does it feel like? Well, I imagine when, when this was called a, a, a no-fuss funeral <laughs> by the Times newspaper last week, I, I kept thinking it can't possibly be no fuss. This is Britain. And sure enough, it is 
absolutely wonderful to watch all these military bands going along. And I think we're going to find the procession behind the Land Rover, the coffin and the Land Rover, extremely moving. You know, Adrian, you've got to admire the Queen. Here she is in deep mourning for her beloved husband. And yet, she made a very important decision this week, and this is what is so amazing about this nearly 95-year-old woman. There was a fuss about whether or not Prince Harry would be allowed to wear a uniform because having left the royal family, he has surrendered all his um, honorary uh, military uh, leadership. And uh, then it was we were told that Prince, Prince Andrew wanted to wear an admiral's uniform. He is an honorary vice admiral, but has not yet been made a full admiral. And I think the Queen just said, OK, no uniforms. We are going to have men in suits, Indeed. women in dresses with medals. Indeed, because this day is about Prince Philip. And as we see here now, that is his coffin being carried by his pallbearers, um, leaving from the undercroft via the steward's door. That is his naval cap atop it. So nothing but the sound of those boots on the gravel. You saw the Prince Philip's standard, his own personal standard, draping that coffin with his naval cap on that Land Rover. Next, we will see the royal family. We know they're already assembled there. We've seen Prince Charles, Princess Anne in the front row, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, and then the grandchildren. The eldest grandchild is Peter Phillips. Prince William, Prince Harry.
The Queen is not alone in that car. She's joined by a friend, her lady-in-waiting, Lady Susan Hussey, who's been with her for a very long time. of the Grenadier Guards begin this procession. It will only take about eight minutes from the quadrangle here to St. George's Chapel. see with the members of the royal family there, no uniforms, uh, their day coats with their medals, Princess Anne, Prince Charles. It's very hard not to think of the last time Prince William, Prince Harry, and their father walked behind the coffin. They were joined then by Prince Philip, who led the way. This day is about him, but it is inevitable that people will be looking at those two young men who both adored their grandfather and hope that from this, some relationships can be rebuilt. You will on occasion, by the way, hear minute guns. So those are being fired by the King's Troop. There you go, that's one now. Royal Horse Artillery. It's coming from the East Lawn. That will happen throughout the procession. And that bell you heard is called, is the curfew tower bell. It too will continue to sound throughout the procession. Every choreographed moment that you see of this was not done in Prince Philip's absence. It was done with his hand. He, he was the architect and choreographer of, of just about everything you're seeing here right now. Those of you who are wondering perhaps where the rest of the family is, where the great-grandchildren are, uh, a separate arrival of some of those family members like Kate Middleton, uh, Camilla Parker Bowles, the Duchess of Cornwall, Duchess of Cambridge, uh, Princesses Eugenie and Beatrice, 
went into vehicles ahead to St. George's Chapel. This is the children and the grandchildren who are walking behind, joined, I, I would say, by some of the members of the royal household who were particularly special to Prince Philip as well. They are at the back of, of that procession, just before the queen in her bent, Bentley with her lady in waiting. Catching glimpses there of other members of the royal family, There's the Duchess of Cornwall, Duchess of Cambridge, waiting alongside there. Majesty the Queen, she will be 95 on Wednesday. Hmm. A moment to look back at her family. So they are all going now into the west steps outside St. George's Chapel. That was the piping party. They, that's something called the still, uh, which was asked for to happen only when the Land Rover is stationary at the foot of those west steps.
those pallbearers, the bearer party, are, are the Royal Marines. Those flowers at the top of the casket were chosen particularly by the queen. We know that as the casket goes inside, you'll hear from the piping party again. They will pipe something called the side. And then soon after that, there will be a national minute of silence. Nothing happens, not even flights in or out of Heathrow in that minute. And the minute of silence will begin as soon as the casket gets to the top of the steps. And when this service begins, a couple things to keep in mind. You will hear music specifically chosen by the prince. Listen in particular for the buglers of the Royal Marines. They will be sounding something called action stations, which is all hands to the battle stations. This, this is something that means a great deal to the prince and this is what he wanted people to hear on this day.
Did you catch that in the moment of silence, that the only sound was that of the birds at Windsor Castle outside St. George's Chapel? For a man who, who loved the environment, who was the head of the World Wildlife Fund, that, that's pretty special. So at this point, we could use the help here of, of Dan Snow. Okay, it's sort of complicated. Dan, sound. as as you are watching, Dan, um, can you give us a sense of, of what we should be looking for here and listening for? Well, I think we should be uh, the, the simplicity of it. That there's there's no sermon. There's no he doesn't want people uh, extolling all the amazing things he did during his life. And I think it's the symbolism. I think the things you look for with all royal historians are trained to look at you know just as art historians we're trained to look at the symbolism who's sitting where what the, what the music is what they what they want to show the world in the in the case for example they want to show the world close connections with canada because as my mum mentioned there were the two uh two decorations on display but also i think that naval hat on his coffin is, is mm -hmm. so important he he began his life at being rescued age two he was rescued by the royal navy from a revolution in greece he ended up being smuggled out on a fruit crate uh, off the island of Corfu uh, in, uh, in, onto a waiting British ship. He then served the one top cadet of his year, um, done on merits in, in the Naval College here in the UK. And he, uh, probably his happiest times of his life really was in command of his own ship in the Mediterranean just after the Second World War. So he, I, I, think, it's, I think the centrality of that sword, uh, yeah. that cap are you know, so important. And, and Dan, is, is there anything, is there anything that you see, you said where people are sitting and how they correspond with each other. Are you reading anything into what you see here? I don't know that it matters on one level, but um, in, in terms of the relationship, and I'm thinking about the two princes who adored their, their grandfather. What, what are you seeing there? Well, we, oh, it's obviously the one thing we're already seeing is how in this family, uh, duty is everything. You, you, you put on a suit, you walk in step, and, and ultimately, if the Queen says do something, you do it. Um, I, I think the other thing you're seeing is the importance. Philip was often, well, there was some embarrassment in the UK, I guess, around Philip's German relatives. All of his sisters married people that had gone to fight for the Third Reich in the Second World War. And, and but the fact those those descendants are being included, those cousins of his are being included in this service, the, the most intimate family group imaginable. You know, there's only, only a couple of dozen people here. I think is important. I think is it says something about about his his true private feelings, his his love of his family that was spread all over Europe by war, revolution, upheaval. I mean, the, the hundred years that he lived through is the most turbulent and extraordinary hundred years in history. When when Philip was born, we didn't know about the Big Bang. We didn't know about DNA. We didn't know about neutrons. Mm. You know, th th this hundred years that he's lived through is is something else. And, and he, in a way, has, has in one life, he, he embodies that trans transformation that's occurred on our planet over the last hundred years. Indeed. So as we listen to you and we see the queen in the lower left of your frame, uh, sitting alone because, relatively alone, because of the social distancing rules that are necessary by this wretched era everyone is living through, let's just listen in for a moment to the music of this day.
the service is just about to start, it will be conducted by the Dean of Windsor. As you will, we will just be listening to it. We're not going to interrupt it un until it's over. And then we'll talk about uh, some of what has unfolded there. We are here today in St. George's Chapel to commit into the hands of God the soul of his servant, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. With grateful hearts, we remember the many ways in which his long life has been a blessing to us. We have been inspired by his unwavering loyalty to our Queen by his service to the nation and the Commonwealth, by his courage, fortitude and faith. Our lives have been enriched through the challenges that he has set us, the encouragement that he has given us, his kindness, humour and humanity. We therefore pray that God will give us grace to follow his example and that with our brother Philip, at the last, we shall know the joys of life eternal.
a reading from the book Ecclesiasticus. Look at the rainbow and praise its maker. It shines with a supreme beauty, rounding the sky with its gleaming arc, a bow bent by the hands of the Most High. His command speeds the snowstorm and sends the swift lightning to execute his sentence. To that end, the storehouses are opened and the clouds fly out like birds. By his mighty power, the clouds are piled up and the hailstones broken small. The crash of his thunder makes the earth writhe, and when he appears, an earthquake shakes the hills. At his will, the south wind blows, the squall from the north and the hurricane. He scatters the snowflakes like birds alighting. They settle like a swarm of locusts. The eye is dazzled by their beautiful whiteness, and as they fall, the mind is entranced. He spreads frost on the earth like salt, and icicles form like pointed stakes. A cold blast from the north, and ice grows hard on the water, settling on every pool, as though the water were putting on a breastplate. He consumes the hills, scorches the wilderness, and withers the grass like fire. Cloudy weather quickly puts all to rights, and dew brings welcome relief after heat. By the power of his thought, he tamed the deep and planted it with islands. Those who sail the sea tell stories of its dangers, which astonish all who hear them. In it are strange and wonderful creatures, all kinds of living things and huge sea monsters. By his own action, he achieves his end, and by his word, all things are held together.
A reading from St. John's Gospel. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believe in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world.
O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who also hath taught us 
by his holy apostle Saint Paul, not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him. We meekly beseech thee, O Father, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him, as our hope is this our brother doth, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all that love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Amen. O eternal God, before whose face the generations rise and pass away, thyself unchanged, abiding. We bless thy holy name for all who have com completed their earthly course in thy faith and following, and are now at rest. We remember before thee this day, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, rendering thanks unto thee for his resolute faith and loyalty, for his high sense of duty and integrity, for his life of service to the nation and commonwealth, and for the courage and inspiration of his leadership. To him, with all the faithful departed, grant thy peace. Let light perpetual shine upon them, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of thy perfect will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, who didst give to thy servant, St. George, grace to lay aside the fear of man and to be faithful even unto death, grant that we, unmindful of worldly honour, may fight the wrong, uphold thy rule, and serve thee to our lives' end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God save our gracious Sovereign and all the companions living and departed of the most honourable and noble order of the Garter. Amen. O God of the spirits of all flesh, we praise thy holy name for thy servant Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who has left us a fair pattern of valiant and true knighthood. Grant unto him the assurance of thine ancient promise that thou wilt ever be with those who go down to the sea in ships and occupy their business in great waters. And we beseech thee that, following his good example and strengthened by his fellowship, we may at the last, together with him, be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord God, when thou givest to thy servants to endeavour any great matter, grant us also to know that it is not the beginning, but the continuing of the same unto the end, until it be thoroughly finished, which yieldeth the true glory. Through him who for the finishing of thy work laid down his life, our Redeemer Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Go forth upon thy journey from this world, O Christian soul, in the name of God the Father Almighty, who created thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, who suffered for thee, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who strengtheneth thee. May thy portion this day be in peace, and thy dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. Thus it hath pleased Almighty God to take out of this transitory life unto his divine mercy the late most high, mighty, and illustrious prince, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Merioneth, and Baron Greenwich, Knight of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, Knight of the Most Ancient and Most Noble Order of the Thistle, Member of the Order of Merit, Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order, upon whom had been conferred the Royal Victorian Chain. Grand Master and Knight Grand Cross of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, Lord High Admiral of the United Kingdom, one of Her Majesty's Most Honourable Privy Council, Admiral of the Fleet, Field Marshal in the Army, and Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Husband of Her Most Excellent Majesty, Elizabeth II, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, Sovereign of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, whom may God preserve and bless with long life, health and honour, and all worldly happiness.
God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the Church, the Queen and the Commonwealth and all people, unity, peace and concord, and to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you always. Amen. So you see the cars start to move there. The family has left St. George's Chapel through the Galilee porch to the music of Bach. And while many people may have questions about what is happening now, where the family is going, what they will be doing, Buckingham Palace has been very, very clear that that is no one's business, that this, what happens this afternoon and this evening, what they do or do not do, is strictly private. The palace won't entertain questions about it. It's not a subject for discussion. And so as we see them drive off, this is likely the last we will see or hear from them for the next, uh, until they decide otherwise. Let's put it that way. It was an extraordinary service. If you think about the intimacy, the forced intimacy of not having that many people there, 
the music that you heard from the choir uh, and the buglers, they weren't actually in the chapel, they were in the nave. All the singers were in the nave. The choir only had four people. That, that is the rule of COVID uh, in the United Kingdom right now. Only 30 people allowed at a funeral, which is why the British Prime Minister, who was offered a position there, opted to stay home and watch on television, as the entire country was asked to do. And those inside that chapel were seated with their households, which is why you saw the Queen alone. Prince William was with his wife, the Duchess of Cambridge. Prince Charles was with the Duchess of Cornwall. And seated across from Prince William, also on his own, was Prince Harry. And in terms of what you heard, as, as we have said, every, every element of what you saw and heard was, had, had Prince Philip's hand in it. And the only personal references to him came at, at the beginning from the Dean of Windsor, who talked about being inspired by his unwavering loyalty to our queen, he said. Our lives have been enriched through the challenges he has set us, the encouragement that he has given us, his kindness, his humor, and his humanity. And so that was the queen in her Bentley with her lady-in-waiting heading back to Windsor Castle. Hmm. Prince Harry and Prince William. Kate Middleton together again. So now shoulder to shoulder with his brother. I think a lot of people will hope this is the beginning of some healing for them. You would have to presume that, that as much as COVID allows, they're off to possibly break bread together at this point. The military, uh, you may have noticed, entirely dispersed in the middle of that service.
And so as the shot pulls back from the grounds of, of Windsor Castle and it becomes quiet again and the family go off to uh, mourn either somewhat together or apart, we do not know. Just curious if, if we can take a moment very briefly to bring in Renee, uh, who was as close as any of us could get there at this point. And I'm, I'm just curious what that sounded like and felt like, Renee, from where you are. Well, there was really quite a bit of silence here as all the cameras and reporters, we all stopped to watch this as well. We are quite a distance, well, not quite a distance, but we're not right in town where these big crowds normally would have been gathered again because of COVID restrictions. The public were urged to stay home to watch this on TV, just like we all did uh, here and, and you did back in Canada. We heard from the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, previously, and he said, this moment, this funeral, it is poignant beyond remembering Prince Philip. It's it's poignant for the people here in the United Kingdom who have lost so many loved ones over the past year. 150,000 people and they haven't had the chance to have proper funerals. He suspects people will be watching this, seeing something of what they've lost as well. Tears in the homes of the living rooms across the nation. And especially when they look and they see that moment of the Queen sitting there alone, her head bowed down, looking at the coffin of the man that she's loved for her entire life. That's, that's such a good point, Renee, that, that how many people have been unable to gather and bury those they love, uh, how many of them are losing them, even as we speak right now. Um, a, a collective funeral like this, if you will, for, for someone so many in the world recognize is maybe a little bit of comfort uh, for a lot of people. I think you'd hope so. And, and the Queen, um, remarkably, always remarkably, she will be 95 years old on Wednesday. April 21st. That is, that is astonishing. And um, I know that this funeral was largely planned by Prince Philip because he, he was in command of, of a lot of what he did. But there's no doubt the Queen's hand uh, is in this as well. And that, that chapel um, now holds people very dear to her. Her father, her husband, her sister's funeral was held there. Uh, Windsor Castle, is, as we've heard, is, has been the hearth for this family. Um, and they are possibly returning to that hearth right now to maybe spend some time together. And I, I know, Renee, I, I, I get the feeling that uh, along Windsor itself, life slowed down, but, but people are eager to, to feel it for themselves again, having been locked down. Absolutely. The streets, you know, are, are busier than they have been for months. The country has been in virtual lockdown since the beginning of January, and only this weekend are people really allowed to leave their own homes. So people will be out today enjoying this beautiful, sunny spring British day, uh, but lots of thoughts will be on the royal family. Uh, and, you know, looking at the family, looking at that chapel, just those 30 guests in there, it had a real interesting feeling, all that empty space. But I was surprised by how just those four singers, just four singers were able to absolutely fill up that space and, and led to a really moving service, you know, despite not having the 800 people that were initially planned and not having that procession from London with thousands of people lining the streets. There was still something so meaningful with all the military involved, exactly the way the Duke of Edinburgh would, wa would have wanted it. Indeed, and uh, the architecture of a nave makes, makes four voices soar indeed. Renee Filipponi and, and to the entire team, Stephanie with you and JF and, and everyone there, thank you, thank you very much for that, Renee. And so now, if we can, uh, the, the former CBC London Bureau Chief, our lovely Anne McMillan, and her son, Dan Snow, the historian. Uh, again, you are with us throughout this day. I, I, I'd really like to get both of your thoughts on the service. Anne, uh, mom goes first, if we can start with you. Sorry, Dan. Of course. <laughs> Um, it was it was beautiful, wasn't it? It was simple, it was elegant, it managed to combine pomp and circumstance with the definite feeling that this was pared down. Thirty mourners allowed in the in the uh, beautiful St George's Chapel because of COVID regulations, but somehow it managed to reflect Prince Philip's life, and it was I like thinking that every single bit of this service he had something to do with. He's been planning it for years, and it was smaller than he probably originally 
imagine, but I'm quite sure that he preferred it that way. And Dan, did you pick up on something that perhaps you hadn't anticipated? Was, was there an element to what you saw that, that struck you? Well, I got little little to add to my brilliant mum there. She's, she's done the job, but as you'd expect. But yeah, I, I was struck by a couple of things. That I, thought, I thought to myself, what an amazing thing. He's been to, this guy's been to more religious services in his nearly 100 years on this planet than anybody else alive. And he just cherry picked the best bits, you know, <laughs> whether it's the lament on the pipes, whether it's the buglers, the Royal Marines, uh, the trumpeters, the, the state trumpeters. So I just think I, I've covered a lot of those events for TV. Uh, and I just thought, how, how brilliant. Like, he's just, he just gone. And, and that was like, a, that was like you know, watch, watching the like, greatest hits. Um, and so I, I was struck by that. I was struck by the Queen being alone. You know, they, there's, there was no concession to, to uh, that they, they, were, they were sticklers for the rules. They were sticklers for, for the, the current COVID lockdown rules. Um, that was pretty tough. And I was also struck, I was looking at Twitter as, as I was, like, there were so many people, I had Twitter open. And people right across the political spectrum here in the UK, from right to left, people that sometimes aren't hugely supportive and sympathetic to the royal family. There was a strong sense here in the UK that they weren't expecting it, but that was a funeral that represented all the funerals we haven't been able to have this mm -hmm. year. It was a, it was a, a, a nation grieving for a, an, a, an aged prince, but also, strangely, given the timing for, well, well over 100,000 other, uh, other bereavements that, that we've all been through. Absolutely, Dan, and not just in the United Kingdom. I, I mean, in, in Canada right now, in some parts of this country, as, as well you know, um, you know the, the case rates for this disease are terrible, and not just the people who've died from COVID. So I think everyone knows several people who have lost family members, and they haven't been able to get there. They haven't been, in, even if it had nothing to do with COVID, they haven't been able to, to hug them, to hold their hands, to bury them, to say goodbye, to be together. So you're right, there is, there is an added layer of this. I, I, you know, and I, I we, we talked initially about, you said that when the queen tells you to walk and step, you do. Uh, and I thought that was poignant and, and I thought it was interesting to see William and Harry walking, but also, Lovely to see them standing together at the end. Is, is that important? Uh, yeah, that was a. That's. I think those are the shots that will probably be, probably be going around the world this afternoon and this evening. William and Harry came out of that church and they were chatting as they walked back up towards the castle. I. I. Yeah, it feels important. It feels important. And and I just kept thinking to myself, what what historian in in fifty a hundred years time will be using this event, as Britain. Uh, as, as this family teeters on the edge of disunity, as the, as the Queen enters her last years, as Britain itself faces breakup, as Scotland thinks about going its own way, as, as we wrestle with this pandemic, how will this event be seen by future historians? I am sure that every single moment, every single, uh, every single look and every single song will be poured over by future historians, and they will come to be seen as heavy with drama and implication. You know, when we spend a day like this talking about a man, sometimes it comes to be that you don't see the man, you don't see a lot of pictures of him, that, that, that all of those images rest in, in people's memories. And I'm wondering, Anne, I haven't heard any stories from you, but I know you. I know you have a few. Can you tell us a Philip story, a Prince Philip story? I will, and I've <laughs> told it a few times already, Adrian, so please, any viewers who've heard it before, forgive me. But I always say that Prince Philip made me a successful journalist because I was out of, just after I arrived in the UK in 1976 to marry Dan's father, Peter Snow, I was invited to the High Commission, Canadian High Commission to meet, or not to meet the royals, but to be at a reception with them. And I didn't think I would meet them, but I was standing, looking around and making mental notes. And suddenly this very handsome Prince Philip, many years ago, walked up and said to me, what do you do to <laughs> occupy your time? And so I told him. And I told him all about reporting. And I told him that uh, there were two television stations at that time in Canada. I, CTV, which is like the independent company here, and CBC, the, the BBC. And I said, I worked for CTV, which I did at the time. And we had a nice chat. Off he went to Canada, got off the plane. Who should he see no matter, as soon as he landed? was a man wearing a CTV blazer. So he went up to this man and he said, I know you're a reporter in London. And Adrian, from that <laughs> moment on, I could do no wrong. <laughs>
wow, okay, you're very <laughs> lucky. That sort of stuff doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Um, Dan, you, you have had some encounters, yes? Yeah, I've, I've met him occasionally at uh, historical events, and when he's, you know, he, he, it's a crazy thing, you know, deep, in, deep into his 90s, he was turning up. I saw him in Windsor once, and uh, about th four years ago now, we, there was this huge parade on the Thames of the little ships that went across to Dunkirk, and all these enthusiasts keep them going, these little, like, little ferries and paddle steamers and the, this kind of fleet of, of hobby craft that went over and helped to rescue the British Expeditionary Force in Dunkirk in 1940. And he was there inspecting them. He had words to say to everybody. He, um, he had a quick chat with me about what I was doing there. And this is a guy who ev nearly every single other person of his age anywhere in the world would be putting their feet up and thinking about a life well lived. And he was out there every single day grinding it out. And, uh, and I guess, of course, that's actually what kept him going because that living with that kind of passion and that sense of duty, wanting to get out there and do stuff, um, is, is, I guess, it's a, it's, a, it's a driver. And, you know, you're a, you're a very tall man, Dan, and I'm wondering, uh, did he tease you about that at all? Well, no, he, I didn't get that intimate, sadly. <laughs> I wish I had. I wish he'd tease me, but, no, he, he was just... He wasn't... Uh, he, he, would, he was sort of... He was very. I noticed that because often, if you are very tall, sometimes people sort of look and think, "Who's that guy over there?" He didn't. He just he gave every single person as he went down this line of veterans and 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 the owners who'd restored. He gave them all his undivided attention. It was quite interesting because I was I was kind of look, trying to look over their heads and kind of catch. Well, I guess not. It kind of catch his eye almost, you know. But he didn't. He just waited, and when he gets to you, he addresses you. I thought that he was very very disciplined. That is that sense of duty. I, I do have a question about the future of his title, the Duke of Edinburgh. W what happens to that title? So that just sits now in abeyance. It doesn't go to anybody like the way that uh, uh, William became Duke of Cambridge and got married. And, and so those, they have like these royal, I mean, it's... I have to correct you. Okay, I'm okay, here we go, Mark. Oh, here we go, the Prince, dynamic Prince, at play. Prince, uh, <laughs> Prince Charles actually inherits the title. So he's going to be the Duke of Edinburgh. Yeah, except that when... When his mother, the Queen, dies, Prince Edward, the youngest son, will become okay. Duke of Edinburgh. So they'll give it out. Yep. So, so Edward, eventually, Prince Edward will become the Duke of Edinburgh. And that's, that seems fitting, and given how the big role Prince Edward has had in the Duke of Edinburgh awards, because so many of the, the young people, certainly in Canada, who receive their awards meet him, so, and, and he seems to have taken that on. So that, that makes a lot of sense. It does, but it's sort of odd that he has to wait until after his mother dies before he gets the title. But this is the British monarchy we're talking about. Well, we even, learn... even those of us who are supposed to understand it cannot go ahead around these titles. I'll tell you, it's, it takes a Canadian. It, it takes a it takes a mum, obviously. Uh, it always takes a mum, Dan. Always, <laughs> especially your mum, uh, Anne and Dan. As as always, it is fantastic to see you. Um, I, I I wish we were there in person, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Adrian. It's been a pleasure being on this wonderful program. Take care. So, Prince Philip, we, we know this, had a very long life, 99 years. There are entire generations now who have never known him as a young man, who may have the most recent images of him forming their entire impressions of the man. So, a photo like this one, shared on Instagram, it can help. This is from a Paris magazine. Perry Match, back in 1957. Have a good look at that face. It is not lost on anyone who looks carefully, carefully there just how much Prince Harry looks like his grandfather once did. So one of the ways so many Canadians know Prince Philip is through what we were just discussing, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. This is a self-improvement challenge for young people. It was launched in Canada in 1963. Some 500,000 Canadians have been through it. They know it as the Duke of Ed. Uh, it is a very big deal. And Bibi Hakim is a gold uh, award winner. And she joins us now from Ottawa. Thank you for being with us, Bibi. What was that like for you to watch that service? Uh, it was very heart founding. Um, it was very touching. I thought it was a beautiful service, um, of course, with a heavy heart. Um, I am so glad to see that the family was able to reunite together to be able to celebrate the lives of His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip. Um, and I couldn't 
picture a better day to do it with the sun shining and everybody together. No kidding. Can you tell me about your award with the Duke of Edinburgh Awards? I, I have to say, I grew up always wanting to do it. I never did it, but I was always envious of my friends who were a part of it. C can you walk me through what it was like for you? For sure. So in 2012 is when I started the award program, and I have my teachers at North Albion Collegiate to thank for that. Um, my geography teacher, Mr. Minchinski, was very adamant about um, students signing up and to doing it. And at that point, um, it was a transition point for me. I was transitioning to a new school, uh, to a new dynamic. So I was very shy and I wasn't as outgoing as now. And the award program allows you to set goals in various different sections of skill, service, adventurous journey, and um there's one part where you're at gold, you have something called the gold project. So once I did bronze, I was volunteering at school and within my community to tutor young children and advocate for mental health. I was on the boys football team. Mm -hmm. I went camping where I met some incredibly young people and mentors along the way who are now my lifelong friends through bronze. And once I completed bronze, um, you know, I said to myself, I, I want to go for silver and see where it takes me next. And when I got to silver and I, you know, started diversifying my skills in ultimate frisbee and volleyball and again, con engaging with my community, um, it got to a point where I pushed myself towards gold. And this journey really allowed me to find my spark and find my passions. And I don't think I would I would be where I am today if it wasn't for the journey. Um for my gold project, I got to come up to Ottawa for the first time with Forum for Young Canadians, where I got to represent my area in writing, and I got to sit into the um, House Commons chambers and the Senate chambers, and that's where, again, I got to meet key people who encouraged my passions in politics and public service. And here I am now, I got to um, intern and work for the United Nations. Um, I'm now working for the Parliament of Canada. So I'm internally grateful to see my personal development with the award program and to see the person that I've become. And for me, it's not just the three little pins that I wear on my chest proudly. It's the bonds of friendship that I made along the way, the challenges and fears that my peers and I overcame, the mentorship and guidance that we were given. and the reunification and celebrations that we have when we'll reunite again when this pandemic dies down a bit. I can't think of a better ambassador for the Duke of Edinburgh Awards than you. You are amazing. Thank you. And I hear, did you meet Prince Harry at, at the ceremony? Yes, I did. In 2017, I was invited to the gold ceremony during the time of Invictus Games, and I was awarded in his presence and gave the keynote speech at that ceremony. That's fantastic. And I, you know, as we're talking about the funeral today, BB, I, I, I don't know if you heard our last guest, Dan uh, Snow, talking about how so many people have been denied an opportunity to say goodbye to those they love uh, in mm -hmm. the course of this pandemic. And so there's lots of emotions going through people's minds. And I'm wondering where your heart and, and mind were in that service. Um, I definitely felt for the family, um, being that I lost one of my grandparents a couple of years ago before this pandemic hit. I was con I consider myself lucky that my family got to be together again and to celebrate his life. So my heart goes out to the members of the royal family and to those who are impacted by His Royal Highness's death. Um, death is a hard thing to deal with, especially as a young person. So my heart is with that family, and I hope that they receive the support that they need. And for anybody else who's impacted by his death, I hope that they're surrounded by love. Boy, all of us can only hope to be surrounded by love. Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards recipient, Bibi Hakim in Ottawa, thank you. Thank you. Well, people all over the world mourn Prince Philip, as, as Bibi described. His death is hitting some especially hard and this is interesting, on the tiny South Pacific nation, of Vanuatu. There, Prince Philip isn't just respected, he is genuinely revered by some. Now, Dan McGarry is a Canadian journalist who lives in Vanuatu. Dan, thank you for joining us. Can you, can you help me initially understand why this is? 
It's hard to know exactly how this all came about because this is very much an organic and, and living belief system. But my sense of it is that um, the, the people of Vanuatu, especially on the, this island in Tana, uh, they have lived pretty much the same lifestyle for 3,000 years. They reject modernity, they reject me me mechanisms and uh, technology. And so when they were confronted with the power and the might of the British Empire, I, 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 my sense is that they had to find a way to reconcile their lifestyle with this uh, force that was coming at them. And by taking one of their own, now they say uh, that Prince Philip was born on the island of Tana, that he rode his horse down to the south end of the island, he leapt into the sea using magic and craft, he found his way all the way to Europe, he wooed and won the princess at the time and spent his life sitting at the right hand of the throne. And this is their way of saying that the power of the British Empire, the most powerful thing that they were aware of at the time, um, belonged to them as much as to anybody else. So I, I suspect that it all comes about as a response to colonialism, to the, the pressures and the, and the forces that were affecting their lives, and gave them a way to reconcile it all and to fit it all back into a harmonious whole. That's extraordinary. And, and is it your sense that, that they would have, uh, I, I don't suppose they would have been watching today at all? Or I, I'm wondering how they marked this day. They will no doubt be gathered at the Nakama, that's the, the, the gathering place in the village of Yonanen, uh, which is the birthplace of the Prince Philip movement. Uh, all the custom chiefs are gathered. They've been working together for several days now since the announcement came through uh, to find the sort of the path forward for this belief system of theirs. They call it custom. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very delicate process. I was fortunate enough to be allowed to attend the first day of proceedings. And, uh, you know, barring the, the fact that, the, you know, all the men are wearing um, very, very little, just a little penis sheath called a numbas. Um, it was being carried on with all the, the, the pomp and the care and the ceremony of a papal conclave. Uh, they're looking very, very carefully at the future and uh, what the passing of the prince means for their, uh, their sense of themselves and their religion. And is it, is it indeed the case that it's a 100-day mourning period for them? Yes, that's, that's standard. Uh, throughout Vanuatu, whenever somebody dies, you observe a hundred days mourning period. Is is it your understanding that that, and I suppose we don't really know, but that Prince Philip will supplant? I mean, sorry, Prince Charles will supplant Prince Philip. I mean, or is it perhaps that, that this is just the end of the movement? I believe that uh, the majority view right now, um, including the top-ranking chiefs on the island of Tana, where this belief uh, is, is held, they all uh, are of the opinion that Prince Charles will succeed his father. Um, Charles visited Vanuatu in 2018, and on that day, uh, he was given a, a ceremonial drink of kava, which is a, a local drink, uh, mildly intoxicating, and it's usually drunk at events of, you know, importance. And they gave him a name, Manareng, uh, which is uh, Tana language, um, implying very, very high rank. This is uh, a, an unusual thing. It's a rare honor. On that day, they say, he was anointed as the successor to his father. Oh, Dan, this has been so interesting. Thank you very, very much. We, we will absolutely be watching. That is Dan McGarry in Port Villa, Vanuatu. So many people have been telling us that the Duke of Edinburgh Award has uh, changed their life. You heard that a bit from BB, set them on a new path. It was certainly something Prince Philip was very proud of. We're going to be hearing more about that throughout the day. I, I, I just want to let you know how this day is about to unfold. Um, because, as you heard there from Dan, there have been commemorations all over the world, including in Vanuatu. Uh, in Canada, there is a national um, commemoration ceremony being held today at 12.30 
Eastern time in Ottawa at the Christchurch Cathedral there. We, we will be carrying that live for you as well, but throughout the Commonwealth there are all sorts of ceremonies and many people are telling the same story, which is the influence his charities and his programs had on them, which is why we keep talking about the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Um, there's a man named John Watts who is an award winner. He has a, he has a unique tale to tell. John, it's really nice to see you today. I, um, I, what connected you to the Duke of Edinburgh Awards? Uh, well, I was in prison when I was 18 years old, um, and the Duke of Edinburgh's Award was a scheme that they put together in the prison um, with the idea that prisoners would be able to gain new skills and use it in a way of rehabilitating themselves. And so what did, what did you do? How did, how did that apply to you? Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh's award, you mean? Yeah, so, so what, did, like, what did that actually look like for you in prison? What did you learn? Um, so basically, it took me three years. So I served three years and three months in custody. It took me three years to complete all four sections. Um, the, the most obvious thing that I got out of it was a skill, which was cooking. So I learned how to cook and, you know, fast forward 12 years, I'm now quite a successful chef. Um, but more than just being a successful chef, I'm... I'm really passionate, like very deeply passionate about what I do. And I think that's the sort of greatest gift I could have taken from it. But then other than that, I mean, I learned all sorts of soft skills and personal skills like team building. Um, I, it boosted my confidence, my self-esteem. I became resilient um, and I had a self-belief once I left prison, I believed that I could achieve something in my life rather than uh, going back to the sort of life that I'd lived, you know, up until I was um, 18, mm -hmm. I was able to make a new start for myself. We were, as you were talking, John, we were seeing some pictures of Prince Philip uh, greeting the award recipients. And, you know, in, in that sort of characteristic way, he's, he's leaning in and talking, his hands behind his back. And, and, I, and I think I could see you in those pictures sort of looking at him. What, what was your encounter like with him? Did you get the sense he was genuinely interested? Absolutely. I was lucky enough to meet him a couple of times. And he takes a real interest in what you've done. And, you know, it, it, and what I loved about him was he sort of puts you at ease. So the first time I met him, I explained that I'd done the Duke of Edinburgh's award in prison. And part of the DOV is stomping up hills, you know, getting outside. So it's obviously very difficult to do when you're in jail. So he asked me how I was able to do the expedition. So I told him that we were out on day release and we went into the mountains with some officers. And then um, he joked to me, oh, were you all attached by ball and chain? And I just thought it was quite funny. Um, but it just sort of put me at ease. I think it was his way of just breaking the ice. And, you know, when you meet someone like that, it's quite overwhelming. So for him to put you at ease like that was quite um, inspiring. No kidding. Can you tell me a bit about your life now? What, what does your life look like now? What are, what are the good things in your world? Uh, I'm loving life at the moment. I mean, like I said, I'm a chef. I absolutely love what I do. I wake up every single morning. I'm excited about what I'm doing. Um, I'm able to, pre-COVID, mentor young kids that are going through similar things than what I was going through before. Um, so I'm able to give back as well as just enjoy life, really. I think that's the sort of two main things uh, that are important to me. That's fantastic. And, and your story about the extent to which Prince Philip would say things to put you at ease, you know, that story echoes around the world. Uh, all sorts of people say that he had this, you know, uh, uncanny ability to either say the right thing or the wrong thing, uh, but, but certainly something uh, that, that would shatter the ice in, in a room. Uh, John, it's been really lovely to speak with you and uh, congratulations on your award. And I, um, I know it, it's been a while, but it certainly sounds like it's, it's made a huge impact on your life. Absolutely. All right, you take care. So just, uh, again, we are hearing f some descriptions of what it was like in Windsor. Uh, for example, The Guardian has been writing that the atmosphere was stark. Those who traveled to witness history were somber. Those who live in Windsor were somber with passersby referring to Prince Philip as the nation's grandfather. You're certainly getting that feeling that lots of people knew him as that older man and that figure, uh, many of whom 
many people have lost someone like that in their lives, certainly in, in this terrible year. So let's head back to Renee Filipponi, who is in Windsor now. And I'm just curious what your final thoughts are on observing this day and feeling it and hearing the birds and smelling the wind. Walk us through what it's been like. Well, it was an absolutely beautiful blue sky, sunny day. You couldn't pick a better day for a funeral like this, where so much of the beginning parts took place outside with those members of the armed forces in that procession. I think for me, the big first moment was when we saw the Queen in that state Bentley and they played the national anthem. That was the first time we saw her. Um, since her, her husband died. And then again, when you're in the church, a small handful of people in comparison to the hundreds who would have been there. And then again, that vision of the queen all in black, all alone, looking at her husband's coffin. Those are images you won't soon forget. But I was really surprised by just how much they were able to fill that large chapel with just four people singing it. And singing. It was it was touching. There were songs picked out by the Duke himself, and it looks as though everything went exactly to plan. But again, no crowds, no one lining the street. This is still COVID times, despite the fact some of the lockdown restrictions are leaving. People were ordered to watch this at home, uh, and, and we've heard from many people. They may have been watching this at home with a tear in their eye themselves, thinking of the people that have been lost here in the UK since COVID started, uh, nearly about 150,000. And as you were watching on the monitor, um, and I, I know the crew is there and there are other journalists, in that moment when Prince William and Prince Harry uh, emerged and started speaking, was that noted by people? How, how did people respond when they saw that? It was probably the first thing we noticed. We also take a look at the screen. So much was made of the fact that the two of them weren't going to be walking shoulder to shoulder behind uh, the funeral procession, that the, their cousin, Peter Phillips, would be standing in between them. The Queen's, you know, was a decision by the Queen. Maybe it was royal protocol, but a lot was being made about, you know, why wouldn't they walk together? Then when that funeral was over, they're, they're mourning their grandfather. They stood together talking to each other. Kate was just a step behind. And it almost felt like old times, like you would have expected those two brothers uh, to interact with each other. So a lot of people you know, are putting a lot of uh, hope on this being a moment of reconciliation um, for what has been a very tense relationship between Princess William and Harry. All right, let, let's hope for the best. So Renee, thank you very, very much uh, for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, in a moment, we will be turning to the pandemic situation in Canada because there are, there are new restrictions. Um, there is ever-growing worry over the surge of cases here. And then in about a half hour's time, roughly in about 30 minutes, we will bring you another service, which is Canada's remembrance of Prince Philip, which will take place at that cathedral in Ottawa. First, though, Let's take a brief look back at the service we just experienced in Windsor as the royal family said their goodbyes to Prince Philip. We have been inspired by his unwavering loyalty to our Queen, by his service to the nation and the Commonwealth, by his courage, fortitude and faith. <laughs> 